So Elliot, thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast, Therapy for Guys. I am really excited to connect with you and have this conversation today. Uh, thank you for having me, Kike. I'm excited to dispel any rumors that folks like Barry Taylor or Peter Rollins have put on this podcast. Ah, it's time okay. to clear the air. Uh, so I'm they, have, to, they have filled my ears with a lot of stuff about you. So we're going to have to kind of, yeah, dispel the myths, man. Well, they're, they're mean boys, you know, there's nothing, <laughs> uh, nothing I can do about, but yeah, I was just listening to your, as I was telling you before we hit record to Barry Taylor. And I'm just always, I could listen to that guy talk for so long. So it's, yeah, uh, it no, and nice. I, I felt a little bad. Cause I think he felt like maybe sometimes we were going off topic, but I was like, that's a part of it. Like, I love when you do your little like side kind of not, yeah. not even rants, but just like explorations on all these amazing topics that I, I now want to go deeper into. <laughs> yeah, he's a brilliant speaking of books that we were, were talking about having books that we haven't read. Uh, I still have his entertainment theology um, next to my fireplace. And I, I look at it, I'm like, what a cool title one day, one day, I'll read it. But you know, it was nice so I actually have to say it. I have read that one. I actually read that when I was in seminary, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah. Oh, how'd you like it? Should I keep it on the shelf or should you I? Should, no, you should definitely read it. It was incredible. Sweet. It's it's like doing like, he's like theologizing popular culture. So it was really cool. So cool. He's a cool man. He's a cool guy. All right. So let me, let, let, let me, let me, let me start with this. As we were talking about this before we hit record, you know, I guess we're sitting here together in part because I had a friend first connect me to Peter Rollins and he was gracious enough to be on my podcast actually a couple of times. And then I found out that he did a podcast with you and was listening to one of the episodes and you were talking about Jeffrey Kripal, who's one of my big heroes in a lot of ways, intellectually and spiritually. And so I was like, man, I've got to connect with this guy. I love comedy. He's super funny. He seems really insightful. So it's just weird how things work that work out like that, you know? Yeah. Kripal has a, um, I mean, he's probably like my favorite writer currently that like is nonfiction that's living uh i i i and i was telling you like i just started the mutants and mystics uh oh, book such a good and one. read so good i i listened to the flip because i knew it was a really short one that was awesome i've done secret body and i've gotten to chat with uh Kripal and talk with him um a, a lot over email and then he had a conversation with me and um he's just also a sweet guy like he has a great sense of humor and he is, I think, if you're interested in weird stuff, the most grounded version of that you can uh, get. Absolutely. So I haven't had the privilege of meeting him yet. I, I would really like to. It's it's weird. Like I have this hang up where I have all these friends, my, my own therapist studied under him. They throw the football around, you know, all the time. They, they know each other so well. But I have this thing where I'm kind of waiting for the right time. And you could psychoanalyze me about that. I don't know what it is. It's probably an insecurity. But I, I've heard the same things that you're describing, that he's just really grounded, mm -hmm. a regular dude. But as his dude, books... It's, I, I know what you're talking about, because like I did the same thing with... I'll, I, I'll have a... I'm good. I think you're doing this too. Like reaching out to people is a very precarious, like awkward thing. Oh, and what I've, yeah, scary. Yeah, <laughs> you put in every time it's just like, there's a little piece of your heart that goes out and you're trying not to make it seem like, like that. And uh, I did the same thing with Ian McGilchrist who uh, oh, yeah. did master in his emissary. Yeah. He's yes. awesome. And same thing where it's like, I, I actually reached out to his publishers and um, trying to get a hold of them, and they, they connected me and it worked out. But like, it, it was that like father complex that kicks in sometimes with these guys where it's like, I'm just intimidated. That's all it is. Like they're, they're heavy hitters and I don't know if they're going to like me and then I'm going to feel like an idiot. And that Elliot, you're happen. exactly right. <laughs> Dude. Okay. Very so I, I didn't realize how vulnerable I'm going to get, but I'm just going to fucking go there. Cause you know, I'm start crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, are you telling me that as a man, I can't cry? Like, exactly. Yeah. No, that's the rule. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, on the uh, podcast therapy for guys. That's the first thing I exactly want to make clear. Exactly. Never to, cry. Never cry. Oh. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have felt, that kind of father energy from there's a guy Richard Boothby who uh, you probably know you know mm -hmm. Peter Rollins really enjoys that's how kind of we got connected to and I feel kind of this tremendous father energy I don't know if Pete would like this but I kind of feel an older brother energy from him you know yeah. I'm, I'm I'm 37 and and so I don't know how old he is but probably like in his late 40s maybe I'm, I'm terrible at guessing ages but no I think that's right 
Okay. I could be wrong. He might be a little older, but I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that on the podcast, but he might be a little <laughs> older. Okay. So yeah, I, I, I totally get like reaching out, but feeling kind of insecure. But then once you connect and they're these sweet guys or gals, it's just wonderful. Yeah. To, mm -hmm. to explore these amazing ideas with them. Yeah. I think there's like, a, there's a little life hack that I think people don't know, which is a lot of these people love what they write about so much that reaching out. And I don't think it's just like strictly in the like psychology or psychoanalytic world. I think it's also a scholars and people in academia want to talk to people and you can very often reach out to people who you see a news article and it seems uh, sensational and you can just reach out to the people who did the study and ask questions and more often than not they'll just like you don't need to they'll just go like oh yeah this is what we did this is what we think is happening and you can give them questions and people are excited about what they're doing and i think that's just like really nice it kind of takes some of the pressure i think off when yes. you're like oh yeah people like this stuff so Absolutely. And then I think you realize they're just human beings like all of us. And, you know, they have their own yeah. flaws and their own struggles and they're living life in the everyday. And, and that, that's been a good experience, too, to kind of not idealize because I, I can I can do that. Right. I think the psyche does that yeah. is, is we tend to idealize others. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's yeah, been you don't kind have of to a do cool that with Pete Rollins. OK, yeah, you, got fine. you. I, yeah. I've got to say <laughs> one of the things I love about the fundamentalists is the two of you seem like you have kind of opposite energies, but it works beautifully and I love it. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, we um we get along genuinely. I mean, I like started crying when he left for speaking of crying um, mm. for Ireland and I still miss him. And it's just a time like, you know, there's a time difference now with me in LA and him in sure. Belfast, but he's still, we have a relationship where it's like, we could do a podcast, or we could just like chat on the phone for an yeah. hour and we will do that probably more often than we should because our podcast is very sporadic. So that's why we, <laughs> I, I was, we're I'm, sad, I'm sad about that. Like, I've, I think I've listened to maybe most episodes now and I was sad that there wasn't more. <laughs> oh, not yet. Yeah, I will do more. Yeah, we, we keep uh, we'll schedule it. And that's then your homework, we'll like, Mr. Elliot. Uh, you know, what? I'm going to write it down. Thank you very much. Geek. Okay. That's your, when you're right, you're right. <laughs> My wife often doesn't tell me I'm right. So when I hear it, I've got to like, <laughs> let it seep in, man. <laughs> Hold that. Just put it in your pocket. Save it for later. So Elliot, do you mind if, if, and maybe one of the ways to start all this, if I go back a little bit to your childhood, right? The therapist in me has to go there and just ask, you know, what was kind of your spiritual background? And if it wasn't spiritual in terms of a philosophy or sometimes guests talk about values that, they grew up with. And I'm just curious if that's stayed with you or if you've kind of radically shifted and you think about the world in different ways. Ooh, nice question. My goodness. Um, thank you for asking. I would say I had a very good childhood. Uh, I was raised in central Florida. I had a uh, heavy involvement with what I guess could have or was once considered a mega church. And okay. it was a charismatic uh, church. So Assemblies of God specifically, I think, is the term speaking in tongues. That kind I was going to say, were you speaking in Wild. tongues? I did not speak in tongues. However, I will go into the weird stuff immediately since okay, we're going to talk about Kripal. We might yes. as well. But I had, <laughs> uh, and I also just wrote about this in one of my uh, papers. But the nice. um, I had a experience when I was like eight or nine, I went to the school that was attached to this mega church. They took us out of the classroom and there was a, what was called the Holy Laughter Revival going on by oh, a pastor. Shit. I think I've heard out. about this. Yeah, it was huge. And it was, it was sweeping the Southwest United or Southeast United States. And uh, this guy named Rodney Howard Brown, who still is a preacher, um, was doing these things where he would lay hands on the congregants and I was one of them. And so as a child, I just remember I had this incredibly vivid memory of having him take out the anointing oil, put it on his finger mm. and put it on my forehead. And I was, quote unquote, slain in the spirit uh, mm. where I laughed hysterically for <laughs> uh, like an hour. And like it was completely un it was completely autonomous, like I had no control over it. And that stuck with me for, I think, a very, very long time and still sticks with me. Um, and I've had similar experiences or darker experiences uh, throughout life. And so there's always been kind of an interest in 
kind of weird stuff, I guess, and also making sense of this. And so I would say I definitely have a different view than I did when I was eight. Um, thank God. But uh, <laughs> it definitely has been colored by that. And I think a pretty good way. Like I lucked out. Like if that's the people, the amount of the types of trauma that people can sometimes experience in religious um, institutions is not the kind that I had, if you could even call it that. It's ironic that what I had was a very strange experience, but it was laughter and joyful. And then I started growing up and then getting into comedy. And so it kind of felt, when I look back, it feels like there was something going on where um, even though I didn't realize it, it was definitely impacting me behind the scenes. Okay, okay. So maybe as a way to kind of make sense of that that spontaneous laughter and then maybe bringing in Kripal for a little bit, you know, he's big on, we have these experiences that, you know, are just our experience, right? We, we can't kind of make sense of them, but they're, but they're real. The next step is to kind of through a hermeneutic process, interpret what they could mean for us. And there's so many different ways we could do that. I, I guess my question is how have been the different ways that you've sort of, interpreted what happened to you at that point like when when when, mm -hmm. when it when it first happened how did you make sense of it and maybe now from everything you've learned and all your experiences how do you make sense of it yeah uh, i think my first interpretation as a kid was just oh this proves the existence of god for me like this sure. makes this means that whatever this church is even as a kid they must have it all completely figured out sure. which is not is that and that's great if you're like in a place I think of insecurity but as a kid it was kind of strange to grow up with this memory that I think n is hard to explain and so a mm. lot of these experiences like William James talks about this in Variety's Religious Experience but which is a great book but one of the elements of mystical experiences is their ineffability and their ability their uh, inability to be described in a, in a way that absolutely is, makes sense but there's also I also went through the phase where in my 20s, like I talked about this in one of the comedy specials, um, the second one, which is not, I don't love, but I talked about uh, this in the terms of it being like a hypnosis. Like it was just a, you know, you're mm. a kid, you're susceptible, you are open to it, you are an impressionable mind. And obviously it makes sense that that would just be hypnosis. And so you could do, you could look at it as that. And that is kind of a flattening out. I don't love that. I try to do both at the same time and be like, yeah, maybe that was just hypnosis, but boy, if it isn't kind of fun and interesting to think about and more, I would say like imaginative or symbolic ways. I, I like Absolutely. That. Yeah. So, so uh, can you do a little bit of that even now? Like what would have been some of the ways that you've made yeah, sense I mean, of it in, in that kind of symbolic sort of way? Kripal helps a lot. I mean, his filter thesis is really, I think, oh, a very yeah. simple and like it just explains things in a way. But I definitely think that there's just different shapes of the same thing that appear in people's lives in different guises. And it doesn't have to be as dramatic as like a big religious experience. But there, it, it seems like there is something that is going on that has a purpose. And I just go, okay, I love entertaining that idea. And then mm. I love stepping back from it and trying to exist in the tension of not really not knowing what it is, like being like that's what a weird thing and that's just one and there were other things you know that have happened where it, it there's some kind of thing that in life where it happens to me that kind of knocks me off kilter and makes me go like oh okay and all of a sudden i get i become a little bit more jazzed up and i'm like oh, okay so there's something else going on here and that gives me i think a, a better like footing in life and it, it makes life a little bit more soulful i guess you could say oh yeah i mean what one of the ways i think about it is you know and just a little bit of kind of my story i i was kind of going through like a faith deconstruction when i started it wasn't technically jungian analysis but my therapist was like the director of the houston jung center and you know, had trained with like James Hollis and, you know, and Jeffrey Kripal. Nice. So he was really deeply embedded in all that. And, and as my faith was deconstructing my, my life and my marriage were kind of falling apart, um, Kripal sort of came in as this resource that I think helped me re-enchant the world and my existence again. Yeah. So, so what you just said really resonates with me that I don't know that I was coming to the same kinds of conclusions about what these things were, but it sort of opened me up to mystery again. Yeah, and, and that was super exciting. How did you find um, Kripal? What was your sort of like introduction? 
So it, it was, um, so the, 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 I had, I had heard about like Carl Jung through like my seminary days. And when I was looking for a therapist, right. Kind of around 29, 30 years old, like I was having a midlife crisis of sorts. Oh yeah. I, I, uh, I was there. I, my, I, in you, my okay. Own. Okay. In your own. Okay. Oh, so you, I was gonna say, wow, you remember mine. You do have some like special powers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. What else do you know? No. And you did great. You did great. TK. Thank you, Elliot. I appreciate that affirmation. <laughs> Anytime. So in, 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 in finding, in finding kind of this union psychotherapist, um, he knew that I was kind of a reader and, and loved ideas. And so he's like, have you ever read this guy, Jeffrey Kripal? And I was like, no, he's like, okay, I'm basically going to assign you all of his books. So we started with the serpent's gift. I don't know if you've read that. No. Oh, it's so good. Uh, it's kind of his take on what he calls a Gnostic approach to religious studies. Oh, it's, was that one of his first ones? Was that it, after? It, it, I mean, I'm yes, it was. College, it, yeah. it was. It was. It was one of his first ones. Cool. But, but you know, as as some people will say, if you've read one of his books, in some ways, you've read them all, <laughs> which which, yeah. which is not a knock, but he just goes back to these themes, you know, and he's so clear. Uh, but yeah, that's, well, he makes that's jokes how, about that too. He's very oh, honest absolutely. about like I've said this. It's the same idea that I've been doing, and it's, oh, yeah. it's one of my favorite things about him is that like self awareness and humor. It's very refreshing in this world. Absolutely, and he's such you know an intellectual giant. But I, I think there's some humility and even a tentativeness about his statements that comes across. That's really refreshing to me too. Yeah, very careful to be like still academically uh, sound and like existing in that space between making a the claims that he implies are are i love them because it, it a makes sense and b is just fun like there's an interesting um it, it, it's it's fascinating like it's fascinating like to imagine the world that he writes about without directly writing about it makes most sense to me and also just like oh how like what could be better i i every page that he writes or that he yeah that i read of his i'm like okay, I'm back in. Like, I know you've said this before and I read it in this and this and this, but tell me again. And he mixes in the Freudian stuff, uh, a bunch of union stuff and just, you know, obviously myths and comic books and all this stuff. It's, it's great. No, it's wonderful. You know, so if, if, if I, I want to ask you this question, but I'll, I'll preface it with, if one of the things he did for me was help me kind of re-enchant the world in my life again, when, when, you, when you started out saying he's probably your favorite author, you know, non-fiction author at the moment, what, 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 what really energizes you about kind of his work and his perspective? Like what, what has he meant to you intellectually? Definitely that. I mean, definitely a certain, I would say, I guess, I mean, it's a great question. It, it is, I think that there are, I think people sometimes, or at least I sometimes have like a itch that can't be scratched mm. with my like normal brain. And he takes, <laughs> Uh, experiences. I don't think you have a normal and... brain. <laughs> I'm just no, I don't. Yes. Yeah. Nor yeah. My broken brain. Uh, and uh, he takes them and, and words it in such a way that I go like, oh, that that's it. And it seems philosophically sound. It seems academically rigorous. And so there's a trust, I think, that like yeah. happens with him. And if we're going to go real weird. Please, um, let's go weird as hell. I Dude, let's do. I'll do a seance right now. Uh, I okay, won't. Okay, let's do it. Um, let's go UFOs. I'll, I mean, let's just fucking yeah. go balls deep into this shit. <laughs> yeah, that's might as well. This is therapy They're for everywhere. guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, he he writes a lot about there's sort of a spiritual element to reading. Um, yes. and there's a back and forth that happens between the reader and the writer. And I, when I read him, and when I read other people who I like, there is a kind of. I think that's entirely true. And when people talk about spiritual practices or they talk about mm. meditation, um, he will talk about reading and the feeling that you get when you're in, it is as if you're in actual communication with someone. And that to me is a spiritual experience. It's just, even if I don't agree with what he's saying, or if I don't find that chapter interesting, there's something where it feels like I'm in communion with something or someone else. And that's really, really great. Dude, so well fucking said, you know, I don't know if you would resonate with this, but he's almost given me permission in some ways to think about myself as a type of uh, mystic or just spiritual seeker, but that's not like woo woo or, or cause I, I don't have spiritual experiences all the time, to be honest with you. Oh, um, I, 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 I haven't had you, right. It's really good. I haven't <laughs> had the extreme, like I haven't laughed for hours at a time, you know, without controlling it. You know, that, I, I, I felt inadequate sometimes when I'm speaking with some of these people about my lack of like spiritual experiences, but I've, I've, tasted what he talks about when he talks about reading as a type of spiritual practice 
I love to read yeah. and I love to engage in conversations. And to me, that's been a legitimate spiritual experience. And I feel like he's exactly. kind, of, kind of giving me thumbs up on that. Yeah. And um, his, his mystical understanding, he says the same thing too, which makes it a, a little easier to digest because it's one thing to read like someone who you're like, oh, this is a guru. This is someone who they're just doing this. Right. Like, it's so beyond me. This is a spiritual right. like, and he's just like, no, he's like, I'm writing about these people. I'm not that like, exactly. Like, Thank goodness. Uh, same thing happens with Jung where it's like, I'll read Jung and I, I love Jung. Uh, but it's important to not put these all, like you were saying, they're all humans and it's important not to put them on any kind of uh, a pedestal. But same thing where I'll read Jung and be like, this guy's saying when I'm this is exactly what I meant. And so it's just, an, it's, it makes life a little less lonely, I guess. And a oh, spiritual well side. said, no, 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 absolutely. Um, th don't you find too, that with Kripal, he's somehow able, he's able to balance that again, we, we, we have these experiences that we can't ever put perfectly into some kind of rational box, but then we should also always kind of have a level of skepticism and doubt and uncertainty about it too. It's, it's very yeah. paradoxical, but that I think is what I really like about him is it's a type of faith and belief and openness, but also a very critical and kind of objective stance toward it, which again, seems like a contradiction, but, but I think that's where it's at. W would you resonate with that? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think contra it is a contradiction and a, I think a paradox, but I think that is the whole point. I, that, I mean, as a, I guess, side note to him is he he it's really difficult at times with the culture now and you know you hear about eco criticism or feminist and queer studies and sure. uh, critical race theory and all these things and he takes i think a really really good stance which is like you you that's important too like deconstructing things breaking things down understanding the material history um and social history of what's gone on and what continues to go on politically is important it's also good to go back to what is like fundamentally human and what our yes. fundamentally human experiences are and so you don't want to flatten out people's diversity or differences or the problems that have arisen as a result of our history nor do you want to make it like all about the you know these like universal claims I kind of lost myself there but you know what i'm saying like there's you, you want to do both and like talk about the universal and then also talk about yeah the actual like problems that people experience that's important Oh, hundred percent. You know, I was talking to a client the other day who's kind of wrestling with his, um, his Islamic faith. And, and we were kind of just bringing in Kripal and, and thinking through how on the one hand, all the religious traditions are, I mean, they're just, they're just historical and they're contingent and they're particular and, and, and you can trace out kind of where they come from, even in terms of the human elements. And I would want to affirm that with Kripal hundred percent. And yet with him as well, paradoxically, almost as a contradiction, there is kind of that thing beyond the historical that I don't know exactly what it is and it's somehow transcendent and it's universal and it's both it's it's I think yeah. what he calls the humanist too right yep yeah it's you're you're both a conditioned like social ego and you're whatever right. the heck else which is a whatever crazy thing to wrap your head is. around yeah <laughs> nuts it's so fun and it is he he uh his human is two is good. And he has this, I was writing, I did a paper for, uh, I took a class and what was called depth psychology and the sacred. And so oh he, my, my professor was that with Lionel all, Corbett. Yeah, it was a half had Lionel Corbett though. And I quoted Corbett a lot, like in so the jealous. Man. One, yeah. His, um, one of his texts was one of the main texts of the class. The, uh, I forget what it's called. I'm blanking off the top of my head, but he, I wrote a lot of Corbett and some of Kripal because the professor also liked Kripal. And has worked with him on some things and uh i brought into the paper the kind of philosophy that kripal brings to the table his kind of dual aspect monism and sure. seeing that like our lived experience is that which splits things apart um is makes perfect sense it also makes it also fits very well within a dual aspect monism where ontologically yeah we're all one and that's all beautiful but we can't experience that as a result of being egos that split everything up Absolutely. I, I know I'm definitely not smart enough to probably even say what I'm going to say, but that's been an area of research I've wanted to get into is the whole Wolfgang Pauli, Jung synchronicity mm -hmm. and their whole thinking on the dual aspect monism. I, I, I really so resonate with the kind of that approach. I, I don't know that I could say much more about it, but 
it, it seems like intuitively correct to me. Totally. Yeah. Synchronicities were one of the major reasons that I wanted to do this particular field of study because I, I love and I felt synchronicities uh, very powerfully throughout my life. And so not all throughout, but occasionally where it's like, oh, my God, that's insane. No, I have and two. This, I, I have two. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some ones where it has it has altered like whatever I was going to do in life. And there have been there's been a lot of books written on it and they're just interesting. Like, and it all kind of goes back to that. There's also the idea archetypally speaking, that there's a kind of trickster element to uh, synchronicities and hmm. Kripal gets into that a little bit. Um, other writers get into it and that's all very fun because then you get into paradox uh, constantly. So I, yeah. I do think it's paradox all the way down and that's the whole thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Have you read Diana Pasolka's American Cosmic? I have it right here and I have read um, about like 30 pages of it, but I did also quote that book because I, I love her very much. I just have Oh my God, me too. I, I've read that book twice. It's fucking incredible. I just saw that she's coming out with a new one like in November. But I think in that book, she says synchronicity is the is the engine of religion. And and I, yeah, I really nice, yeah. I really resonated with that. So I, I wonder, would you be able to speak to maybe a synchronicity in your life that was like meaningful? That, or that, that, that really kind of like changed things for you? Yeah, yeah, I had a good one where I had, um, I mean, this is uh, still pretty wild, but I, it was, how do I say this in a way that doesn't piss anybody off? Sure. How do I say this is <laughs> vaguely uh, not name names? So there was, I was uh, dating a person for a while uh, and- Were they human? We, they were human as well. <laughs> Well, off record, I'll say maybe not. Uh, okay. <laughs> demon. Uh, no, she was great, but uh, <laughs> fine. But we, it was like my therapist described when we were dating as it was like our relationship was like looking out on a beautiful, placid river, it's like a cabin mm. next to it. But then when you go up to the water, you just find that it's stagnant and disgusting and there's no life in there and it's all just mud. But from the outside, it looks really great. Mm. But there's no juice, there's no movement. And so I was basically, we were dating for a while and it didn't seem like it was going anywhere. And I brought it up at one point and uh, it kind of seemed like me bringing it up didn't work. Like normally you would think that if the dude is like, are we doing something here? That the girl would be like, absolutely. And this wasn't gonna work out. And I think that was for the best. And however, it bummed me out. And so I start, what I'll do to cope with things is I'll listen to music. And mm. I listen to super crappy, like pop music. I'm not a like uh, music aficionado, but I find bands and singers that I like and I stick with them. And I discovered this uh, guy, his name is uh, Ricky Montgomery. He's like a poppy, uh, this pop music, basically. I found him on Spotify and his songs were like killing it for me. I was like, this is incredible. And I had booked a cabin in the uh, Big Bear in the woods. Oh, yeah. For me and what was, I'm assumed going to be my new official girlfriend. And we were going to have a great time, Big Bear in this cabin. And it didn't work out because I ended up breaking things off as a result of the conversation we'd had. And so I was all bummed out. I was like, I'm still going to go to this cabin by myself. And so on the way, I'm listening to this guy over and over again. I think the song was called This December. And I was like, this is so catchy. I love it. I show up at the cabin. Some of my other friends are around town and I sleep. Uh, I'm wait I'm listening to the guy. And uh, again, cause I get really obsessive over this stuff. And I was like, <laughs> man, this guy's so good. I'm looking him up on Twitter and all that. And it's all great. And then I was like, all right, I gotta go meet my friends. And I was still kind of sad because they're all like married and they have kids and all this mm. stuff. And I was, you know, late twenties, that kind of like midlife, I guess, crisis of some kind. And so me and my buddy meet and we go into this bar and uh, we're sitting down and I look over and there is the Ricky uh, guy. He's sitting there. Uh, he's in the what? restaurant. And Holy I shit, was man. like, hold on. And I turned to my buddy and I was like, is this guy like is this what he, he is this who this guy is and uh he was like yeah and on spotify it's like still halfway through the song i go over to the guy he i say hi and introduce myself he was familiar with some of my stuff from the internet and wow he was having uh he was hanging out with a guy who had also um uh uh dated uh you do editing in this i don't 
oh shit okay uh he was also <laughs> there was another element of it that was really interesting and so i was like oh this is crazy that uh i am uh seeing this guy and then it, the song that i really liked was interesting because it was called this december and it was that later december that i uh went out uh with who became my wife later and so there was wow. all these kind of the more i held it and looked into it there was just weirder and weirder things about it and it was also just like a crazy coincidence like it was a crazy coincidence which is what synchronicities are and so that i think stuck with me because it was like it felt like the universe whether that's happening or not it felt like someone had seen me and was understanding and it, it felt like oh, okay like whatever was happening there was some kind of flow going on if that yeah. makes any sense yes oh my god so i think the the question that's like coming up for me if you can go there and, and I think you kind of already have in some ways, but I'm wondering if there's like a next level is if you do the whole hermeneutical step of making sense of the synchronicity for your life, what kind of conclusions did you draw or, or what, what, what was it trying to get you to do in the world? I think that there, I mean, I take now mostly a depth psychological, um, framework for this and i i'm not married to it i don't sure, think that sure. it's like a, a biblical thing but there is the idea of the self capital s uh and jung writes that the any experience of the self feels very much like god like it it, it has that kind of quality to it yeah and i have in my life come to an understanding of these types of synchronicities where to me it feels like there's a playfulness. There's almost like a sense of humor behind a lot of synchronicities in my life that is humbling and it is kind of crazy and it's off, it throws me off kilter. But my experience of like spirit, the spiritual world is that it is not as serious and morose as we like to think. Mm. And so my synchronicities that I tend to, to have happened to me, I kind of take with like a playful stance and they seem to occur in a playful way, which is yeah. just a very, uh, it's just nice. And I, I keep falling back on that word because it's kind of a pop out, but it also was a very transformative experience and it made it confirmed where I was at. And it, I think could not have happened. Like it, I don't think I could be with who I'm at now, uh, had I not made the decision in that conversation to cut things off and because I would have gotten in my head about it it all happened even the, the breaking things off I wasn't planning on it so like stuff gotcha. was coming out of me that I yeah. wasn't, didn't feel in control of um so yeah it, it kind of makes me feel like it, there's a sort of uh, riverbed that people can get into and yeah. I like that dude Elliot man I'm so grateful you're sharing that it's just so powerful you know maybe it's super obvious to you and people that are listening but I'm just kind of struck by whether it's your early experience, you know, laughing uncontrollably to what you just said about the sacred, having this playful dimension to yeah. your vocation <laughs> as a comedian, right? Like, holy yeah, shit, not... man, there's been a thread throughout your life. I know it's so weird. And I didn't want to be a comedian. I still don't like love being, I don't love being referred to as a comedian. I, okay. And so that only speaks to the fact that it felt like me doing that and still doing it in my own way for so long that also didn't feel like it was, oh, I laughed a lot as a kid because that was some weird, you know, church thing. And now I'm going to go be a comedian. It just has kind of unfolded that way. And I think that's okay. pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So w one of the things I'm curious about is in terms of your program, could you speak a little bit about it and, and kind of what you're hoping to do afterwards? As a, as a yeah. mental health professional, I'm, I'm always curious about that and would love to just connect with you over that. Yeah, no, it's super. I'm also excited to find out uh, what I do with it. Um, my goal is not to be uh, a therapist one on one. I think mm. that the outlook I have uh, on life being maybe a little bit more uh, irreverent and playful is not necessarily what needs to be brought to the table in a very serious therapeutic session where someone needs like uh, gravitas and kind of like a um, stability. And so I like the idea of going into the culture and talking about this stuff and also doing research and writing and, and, and formulating the stuff that I'm learning in a way that uh, is palatable for people. I think there's a lot of this stuff that is so interesting and so, so like 
enriching and yet i think it's sometimes there's a little bit of a gate a gatekeeping thing yes. that happens yes. and i don't like that so i'd like to kind of make this stuff more um you know demystify it a little bit <laughs> and then also uh speak to a lot of young men i mean what you're doing with therapy for guys i think is a great thing and i think it's mm. important and uh i also think that therapy for anybody um can happen no in, just for men i'm just kidding you know, yeah exactly yeah they're fine the ladies are fine yeah uh, but it can happen you know in the therapy office and it can happen outside i think synchronicities are a kind of therapy outside of therapy like mm. a kind of something that you can experience it's nice the program itself i do is called deaf psychology with a specialization in union psychology and archetypal studies and so a big okay. part of it is also archetypal psychology which is uh founded by james hillman who dude was now he's my favorite of, I nice love, okay yeah. cool I, I have kind of a Dude, funny you've story read your about crap, him. man holy crap you <laughs> you get it <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's that's why uh well it's funny like i feel a little bit insecure because i think right from what i could tell peter rollins does not like jung and no. uh you know he that's gave the me, other reason i love Jung, by the way yeah he gave me some shit about that but but my understanding you probably know this better than i do there are the kind of fundamentalist unions out there, but you know, even Jung himself said, I thank God that I'm not a union. Uh, yeah. Guys like it, yeah. right? Like guys like James Hillman kind of radicalized it and, and kind of moved it in a different direction. And that's where I really resonate with it. Yep. I even like the concept of depth psychology. I think even Freud can be included in there. So they do include technically depth psychology includes Freud. Yeah. I don't think Freudians um, like, no, I don't, I don't think that. they like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think is funny. I've, I've considered doing my dissertation on the relationship between Lacanian psychoanalysis and union psychology, but oh, fascinating. I think it's fascinating. I think I might get bored uh, with it a little <laughs> bit. I don't think it, it quite speaks to me, but it is, I am very interested at the intersection because yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of all of it. Like I think yeah. that the Lacan and Hegel and when you get into Zizek and all these people are, I think they're awesome. And so I, I feel like, uh, I don't know that maybe the, the infighting is necessary most of the time in this world, but people get very serious and, and, and very like, no, this is what it is. So I'm like, all right, good for you. You know what it kind of reminds me of is like some of my past, you know, in the church and different denominations and, and what do they call it? The, um, the narcissism of small differences where mm -hmm. people will fight nice. to the death over, you know, these tiny little differences. And it's like, man, maybe I don't fully yeah. understand why we're fighting, but I, I'm not sure I want to be a part of that. Yeah, no, it sounds very exhausting. And I think, I mean, I understand the danger of getting too like fundamentalist -y into Jung um, because the dude is a weird dude. And He's like, a weird he dude. He got weirder as he aged, which is another thing I like uh, about the guy. Like he he went from trying to be this empiricist and be objective about everything. And then it just starts coming through the cracks as he, his writing continues, where he starts making some pretty wild claims. And, and I like that, too. I like all the sort of weird esoteric stuff. I, I, I do, too. I, I'm not sure that I fully understand it. And I, I don't always have like actual practices that help me like experience it yeah. but i love reading about it and getting into it and trying to understand it yeah say i think that's like as close as i can get it's like i can read about kundalini yoga uh, <laughs> right. and i'll be like this is cool and like i'm not gonna do it yeah so yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. same here same here and Did i think you... even Jung said that he was like read about it but for god's sake don't actually do it and i'm like all right man like people, <laughs> cool i can do it. that i could do that man <laughs> So do, do you have like, so in your, in your like program, your thinking, your experience, when, when, when you mentioned like even possibly working with like young men or as you think about like masculinity, you know, obviously this is therapy for guys. I, I think about some of these issues quite a bit, uh, just personally in my therapy, I'd love to hear just some of your thoughts on, I'm not exactly sure how to frame it, you know, modern masculinity, or maybe some of the issues that you see out there or, I'd love your take on how you think about, yeah, young men and, and some of the issues that we're facing. And we're, I mean, what a, a great question. It is, well, I'd be curious to hear your take too, because I, I imagine we're going to be pretty close I, on yes. whatever. Um, my, my, mine will be better, I, but you know. <laughs> absolutely, it will. I mean, this is your, yeah, uh, you're, you're way ahead, but uh, I feel like there is, when it comes to guys in particular, I look at 
the loneliness and the sense of uh like mm. unrootedness i think that is happening right now with the, a lot of dudes and i look at my own experiences in life and i can relate to what they're experiencing yes. i can relate to going through that kind of thing and i also look at what how my life has transpired and i i look at how happy and really just incredibly lucky and blessed or whatever word you want uh with my life and relationship and so there's a little part of going like why why how is it that this has been okay for me and what did what happens like why is it okay for me and not not for a bunch of other dudes and you look at the more extreme versions of um these groups incels being or right. they call themselves themselves i've actually uh, done therapy with with incels believe it or not how was that maybe uh within as much as you could say <laughs> i guess it, it, you know, and, and, and sadly with, with the one that I'm thinking of, we, we had to kind of terminate because for a variety of reasons, but his, his views got so extreme that he started getting into, I think it would be okay to like sexually take advantage of a woman. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had to kind of like part ways at that point, but, wow. but before that, I'll just say it was, it was deeply tragic and, you know, mm -hmm some of it had to do with his own sort of autism diagnosis and some of the difficulties that created. But I think I was able to hold the space of, wow, I really disagree with you. And I think in a lot of ways, you're like really thinking about this in really fucked up ways. But I also have tremendous compassion for all the bullying you've experienced, all the awful ways yep. that people have treated you throughout your life. So it was, it was a weird kind of experience to kind of work with this person. So wild. I mean, that level of doing that intimately one on one. Um, good for you. I mean, that's got to be tough. Like to hold. Oh, it's that, extremely uh, tough. Space. It's extremely tough. And yeah, and you know, I, oh, go go ahead, Elliot. Well, I was gonna say I I found out last month. I one of our classes we have to do this thing where we make a paper able to be published, and I'd written this paper on. Uh, it was called Apollo Online, and it was basically mm. taking a mythical look to far right internet uh, subcultures, and oh, one of them is the incel. It was really fun. I, I I submitted it, and I found out recently that it is getting published, which is crazy. And that was one of those things where I was like, all of this stuff. I go, I, I'm I'm neurotic uh, about keeping one foot in and one foot out. But when something happens where it kind of like confirmed that okay, like I'm actually okay at this that was really nice but in it i read a lot about incels and a lot about sort of this mentality that dudes can have which i think is very often a hyper rational left brain um you know the facts don't care about your feelings stuff i right. i adamantly disagree with and living your life like that where you're living from a distance uh and you're living you know a very sterile clinical like everything needs to have this is just what it is like it's rational and women don't like this and all that it's like you're missing out on a bunch of other aspects of existence that are uh maybe scary at first but also that's what life is like I, you can't cut out the chaos and just exit life so oh absolutely so okay one of the things that that i want to kind of ask you about and this will hopefully bring in james hillman and and when you said you know kind of what's my take on some of the masculinity stuff I wonder how you feel yeah. about someone like Jordan Peterson, who I'll just say he comes up in my therapy office from my clients probably every day, multiple times a day. He's a huge influence yeah. on a lot of the young men I work with. Yep. Uh, I definitely have been impacted by Peterson. And I, I will say I love James Hillman. I, I'll just say that. I love James Hillman. We'll leave it there. But no, I, I, do <laughs> I was going to say, do I need to go ahead and uh, cut, cut off this conversation right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's it, over. So much added. No. <laughs> um, I have a real hard time with uh, Peterson. And I, I, I think that I will say, in, to give as nuanced of an opinion as I can, I really think he's done a lot of good, like, horizontally like i think he's 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 his impact uh in terms of the amount the quantity of people he's positively impacted i think is really good i think he gets a bad rap when he goes on um interviews and they accuse him of being like the king of incels or like sure. caring about young men as if that's like um you know backwards or he's like encouraging their way of i don't get that uh from him 
I also think from what I understand, I, I have a buddy who went and saw him live recently and I was pleasantly surprised to hear that he did, he was talking about kind of the archetypal, like the plurality of the psyche, which goes back to Hillman and uh, our, uh, archetypal psychology as a whole. Yeah. And so I like that, but uh, now do I like Peterson? I, I, I have a very difficult time. I think he seems to have mildly lost his mind a little bit. And yeah. I don't know why he's up at one tweeting about like he just seems when we talk about psychotherapeutic stuff and ideas like peace uh and sense having a sense of humor or levity sure excuse me i don't really see that uh in in him so much i see and maybe that's just a front facing thing like i don't know but when i he's on he tweets nonstop, and it's all this like everyone's out to you know the world's sky's falling and uh chaos everywhere and these you know and and i think his take on climate change i think is um backwards and wrong and actually really dangerous and so yeah. that's a big problem yeah but you know, that's just my take and i i think he's a well you, 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 a you are ideas. you are the take right to listen to so i think this there is the definitive word on peterson mr elliot morgan <laughs> i'm a I, yes i'm the master of uh, <laughs> you are the master <laughs> the, the, i the, i wish i uh, honestly i'll just say one more thing which is please I, genuinely I do get to a place where I kind of worry about him because I think that that the project that he's doing is incredibly important I think it's mm. compromised when he starts getting over he starts entering into areas where he just doesn't have any uh expertise in it and that's a great way to put the, it yeah and denying the stuff that we've done to the planet and seeing anything that attempts to fix that as a attack on you I don't I genuinely don't understand so yeah. maybe he's right and I'm wrong. So I, ha I have a good friend that actually knew him in Canada a long time ago and said he was a pretty good guy, was really helpful. He didn't do official therapy with them, but they actually went out to lunch a couple of times and it really helped him change his life, believe it or not. He said something happened when he got into the political arena and, you know, he, he, he became this huge figure and I don't pretend to understand it all, but it's like he shifted into something else. So that's, that's one thing yeah. that I always kind of point out. The other, the other piece that I've been thinking about recently, and I'm, I'm wanting to have this, this guy who's done some work on Hillman on the podcast to maybe wrestle with this, but I'd be curious to hear if you have any initial reflections. It seems like Peterson has kind of gotten into some type of Christianity where, you know, he does the lectures on like Exodus and Genesis. And, and the other day I heard him talking about, you know, the importance of monotheism. And that to me kind of threw up a red flag because I'm such a Hillman fan and his idea of like the polytheistic psyche, right? Mm -hmm. That that part of what we need to move away from is this mono psyche or this monotheistic psyche. And as, as it comes to, to thinking about masculinity, that's where I get nervous is any vision that says a man should be this one thing or that one thing. I, I like oh, nice. sort of the Hillmanian idea that, you know, if we looked at it from a masculinity perspective, it's inherently pluralistic. There's not one right mm -hmm. or wrong way to be a man and i think opening things up could be a really healthy move in our culture yeah i agree i mean i've my and i don't know how correct this, this is all secondhand but from what i understand the talk that he did he he brought it back to monotheism at the end and again this is like a using these terms in a um metaphorical sense i sure, assume maybe sure i imagine your yes. audience knows that but there's a talking about yeah the, basically there's the psychic constant contents uh, are not always singular. And my understanding is that actually he did make a good case for kind of the polytheistic nature of the psyche, but then brought it back to the monotheistic thing. Okay. I think both those okay. things are important. I mean, Jung did that. That was one of Hellman's like major deviations from Jungian psychology is he got away from the archetype of the self and didn't see it and saw it really as just a, a iteration of monotheism, which I think Hillman was right there. Like Hume took Christianity and inverted it, and made it in the psyche, and that works for a lot of people. Sure. Um, and Hillman, you know, threw all that up in the air. It was like, no, it's actually just like a, you're in a matrix of of competing and complementary forces all the time. And that I think is a more accurate way of understanding how the psyche works. But I'm curious sure. that where where Peterson actually falls on that or if he falls anywhere maybe he goes back and forth i don't know yeah no that's that's a good point you know i i always forget who said this but somebody once told me you know when i feel like my life is just fucking chaotic and falling apart i go back to jung when i'm really bored and i feel like static and stale i read hillman 
And, and, and I think kind of that nice. existential balance is really interesting and probably true for me too. Like, that's why yeah. I go back to Jung and Helm and it's like, okay, how do I feel today? Am I falling apart or do I feel like really bored? And so, yeah. you know, there's these two like different dynamics at play in both of them. Hillman really pisses me off. Yeah, he, he gets me <laughs> like, I, I will go, I'll either be reading him and be like, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. Or I'm like, you are being purposefully mm. like a, a kind of a dick here. And he, he was kind of, my understanding is he kind of was a dick sometimes and knew he was a dick. Like Dude, he recognized that. I That's got a nice. story about that. So, so my therapist, uh, he came and he gave these lectures at Rice. And before my therapist was the executive director, he was just like helping with IT at this at the Jung Center. Which, by the way, if you ever come to Houston, you got a place to stay here. Like I got you. Right. And thank if, you. If, yeah. So um, I, I won't uh, uh, sneak into Kripal's house then. Ah, uh, uh, maybe we can go together and visit him. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, he so Hillman visited the center and uh, my therapist kind of walked up to him as a young, I think it was an undergrad and was like, I just finished uh, revisioning psychology. It was great. And his response was, it was brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> and he said, he said, uh, did you read the footnotes? Because that's where the brilliance is really at. And so he was like, man, nice. I, I love this guy, but he's one arrogant motherfucker. So <laughs> yep, yep. And it's uh, what a what a way to be. I mean, uh, I can't imagine having that mentality, but, uh, and his whole thing was always, I mean, he thought everything was psyche and was such a, just absolutely loved the psyche. And I'm sure in his uh, mind, he's thinking, I didn't write that book. Like something wrote through me or I was being written sure. and that kind of thing. Sure. I, that's the nicest thing I'd say. But yeah, he also seems like just, he doesn't seem like a guy I'd want to hang out with. When it comes no. to you, I would be like, we could have fun, but I don't know. I feel like him. I could have a, a beer with you. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to spend much time with Hillman. The, the other thing I've heard is when he did analysis with certain people, if they had dreams that were too Christian, he would get mad at them. And, and want he got to real of, bent out of shape about Christianity. He's it's like, real dude, pissed. you know, you, you, we can't control what our psyche produces. Like if, <laughs> if, we're, if, we're, if we're dreaming about Christianity, like that's what we have to wrestle with. Like don't force this like Greek mythology on me if that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, this is like uh, when I talk to Pete, it's just me going like, no, I like it though. And he's like, oh, it's, it's not so bad. It's not <laughs> very fun. Nice mirror. So, okay, I, I know I want to be sensitive to your time. Maybe maybe one more question if you have time for no, it. No, dude, uh, I got time. Okay. I would say, I think, um, let me double check. You, uh, you're not going to edit this. I'm going to keep talking the whole time. And I'm gonna okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I think, I don't know if I said this while we're recording, but going to Universal Studios. And yeah. Stuff, that's such a funny, what a to-do list. Uh, <laughs> I love trying to present like a scholar on things and then be like, all right, I got to go ride the movies. Uh yeah, I'm good. I mean, I got probably 15 minutes, okay. 20 minutes, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess one question I have for you is wh whether it's your studies or just your own like personal reading, I, I know we've kind of connected some about Kripal. Is there anybody else that, you know, is just kind of capturing your imagination recently, like that you're just kind of energized about any, any thinker, any, any person nice. that, that you're just kind of really reading these days? I'm always yeah, interested in finding out, you know, new people to read. Yeah, we could talk, talk about this. I feel like we're just getting the conversation started too. So I yeah. apologize for the t uh, time frame. I would say that, I mean, Ian McGilchrist uh, was definitely a game changer and understanding the hemispheres or at least having a, sure. a idea, um, broadly speaking. And I try to, between classes, because this material at school can just get very like um, ethereal and yeah. very like heady. Uh, That's like depth psychology to, for you, huh? It really is very, yeah. And sometimes it gets too much. And I was like, ah, come on, guys. Like, this, you know, whatever. And speaking of Hillman, he talks a lot about the difference between spirit and soul. And so his right, like right. Peaks and Veils essay is so good. And yes. the soulful stuff of going down is um, sometimes like you have to do that and it gets lost if you're always in the clouds. So I try to, my way of doing that is to read about politics right now to try okay. to get a better understanding. That way it's like I, I'm studying the historical and the material material reasons for things and i'm trying mm. to do that in a way to compensate for all of the psycho weird woo woo stuff so <laughs> people like cornell west um, okay reading yeah a book right now called uh ghost wars and a book called hubris both of those are about the um 
the the 9-11 and the Iraq war and that kind of stuff so it's like that's helpful because it makes me ground myself and what that. I'm doing and I think Cornell West is as a Christian um completely like he's in terms of being a Christian what I would want to uh aspire to be he's funny he's got this sort of like he takes a prophetic stance to Christianity rather than like a Constantinian stance. And I like that a lot. And I think his okay. writing is just great. So his book is democracy matters. And I'm, I'm enjoying that right now. Okay. Oh, awesome. I'm going to have to, I've, is, he's one of those figures I've always heard about, but I've actually never read. So, uh, I'm he's just another weirdo too. He's okay. a good, like, he's, he looks like an insane person. He looks like he got, he put his fingers on a wall socket all the time. And, uh, <laughs> With I his crazy this, hair. Uh, yeah it's absolutely insane uh hair i'm trying to think who else but yeah i mean i've just been like we're saying di devouring uh, oh and then a lot of the books that i've been doing are just cripal um like tangential where he'll mention a book like in the footnotes and then i'll i'll order that off of amazon and so i was actually bringing it full circle reading this book called when god talks back which is written by like a stanford uh anthropologist about sort of the charismatic um Christian movements and where they yes, came from. And yes. that's been really interesting too. Okay. Oh, awesome. Now mentioning Christianity, I'll, I'll just throw it out there. You know, I, I don't know that I identify with that tradition any longer. It is sort of in some ways my roots and I understand it pretty well, but I just don't know what to think about Christianity. And actually people like Peter Rollins and Jay Baker are kind of helping me think about it in different ways. I'm just curious where you land. I know that's kind of a loaded question, but I, I just want to give you space to kind of explore no, kind of how you think about your own Christian identity, if that's even something that fits anymore. Yeah, I wouldn't say it fits in any way that I would feel uh, comfortable like saying that I'm a Christian. I can yeah. say it in my own way. Pete's really good at this. He'll say he's a Christian and the way he is a Christian is not what people hear when, you know, they hear the word Christian. They right. like, that's not really it. And so yeah, I yeah, wouldn't... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I certainly don't uh, subscribe to an evangelical, like, you know, I don't think people are going to go to hell. I don't think there's going to be a, a, well, I can't talk to you anymore but, then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll, if there is a hell, I'll be the, one of the first ones to know, but the, yeah, uh, yeah. Same here. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I leave on a lot of the metaphysical stuff of Christianity and I, I still find Jesus fascinating. I also find biblical scholarliness really fascinating. Okay. Even though it's not really my, world but hearing people who have studied this for their entire lives does kind of shed light on the bible in a way that isn't what i grew up with where it's not like oh this isn't a religion of you constantly sinning and there's you know whatever i think my relationship is i think with christianity is i think it's great it'll always be a part of me uh i do follow more of that dual aspect monism type stuff and i think that there is a mystery and an other that we are not supposed to know about and i i think that is yeah. better i think it's sure. uh, I, I would hate to i'm so you know and this might be my own like neurosis but i would hate to reach a place where i'm like nailed it like i got it all figured out mm. and the, uh what i appreciate about yeah it's a lonely place and, when you get there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, exactly. you know one day man I'll, I'll be i'll be there uh wait for me uh, okay i, I yeah, guess I, I like, hey, there, there are many mansions when you get here oh yeah and you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh yeah so that's that my thing. i mean that's not really an answer i always kind of like come back to christianity and i always have a soft spot for it sure but that's you know it's it's also because i know it's played and plays a big impact on my life as well as all of western culture like we yes. are still very much a christian nation and i see the religious like zeal being funneled into politics being funneled into um materialism and i think that that is that's not good either like i, I think mm. that that single singular monotheistic focus is in any direction is not necessarily a good thing yeah absolutely Okay. So, Sometimes I just talk, man. Does any of that make sense? Like, I feel like I'm going on crazy teams. No, well, <laughs> here's the thing, though. I'm, I'm a fucking weirdo, and I love deep things, and I've studied these things for years. So I, I'm just resonating 100% because I really understand it. Whether the listeners will get it, I'm not sure. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really uh, skimmed over, like, terms. Like, I'm, I'm listening to someone listening to this going, like, what is depth psychology? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. fair question. <laughs> I, I don't know. No one knows. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. You know, I was going to say even before we hit record that uh, 
I have found the more I understand, the more I study, the less I understand. Like the more I realize, I don't know yeah. what the fuck I'm thinking about or talking about, but I'm okay Dude, with that. Maybe, maybe that's maturity or after you, you know, you get into the second half of life, you know, as some people would say, you're, you're okay with the not knowing. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's that classic union, like the process of individuation and the Absolutely. second half of life. And Absolutely. you, yeah, you start kind of moving toward, uh, something that is beyond the ego and um it gives meaning and purpose to life which is really great but sure. uh yeah the, the the depth psychology stuff is i think my favorite thing about it is just that it honors that constant mystery but my question to you is oh shit <laughs> ufos what's oh, your gosh. status on UFOs? because it's been in the zeitgeist for me okay and then I after i answer this can i ask you a question about dreams because i want to know what you think about dreams please do okay uh, oh man, you're putting him on the spot. I think in a very kind of cripal, uh, Pasolke kind of way, I think there's something there that is real. I have no fucking clue what it is or what it means. Great. Same thing. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> we can skip it. Yeah. That's okay. all it. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, I will say a funny, I think you might find this interesting. The person who introduced me to cripal was uh, a buddy who was also a former pastor and ah, uh he introduced me not only to cripal but also the um american cosmic uh, pasuki Pasuka, uh, oh, book. Man. and that got me really really into cripal but i think it's very interesting that it was a uh pastor who did it, it and he does a lot of deconstruction in his church and like oh, okay. getting people kind of out of the dogmatic part of that faith and uh maybe yeah, after the episode just, i could ask you about him maybe i could connect with them yeah i think you'd be, be a great uh, okay guest. Yeah. okay awesome awesome um so yeah so that's kind of my take now in terms of dreams in terms of your studies your own understanding of it maybe in your own therapy do, do you have i, I don't I'm not even wondering about a quote-unquote theory but just do you have a sense are dreams important to you do, do you do you think about them in a certain kind of way are, are they meaningful yeah yeah absolutely okay. yeah, i mean me i go too. right yeah i go hard in the paint on that because i okay. uh i've experienced weird ones i've had mildly precognitive um experiences and i've just read a bunch on i mean I, one of our classes was entirely on dreams and the different ways you can interpret them and yeah did you read one mary way, watkins is, i think is her name did you ever i don't know that i did i don't okay. remember okay. years ago but i don't think so it doesn't okay. ring bell um a lot of uh, Eisen, Steve Eisenstadt does a lot of stuff with dreams. And then you go into the Freudian understanding of dreams and, you know, everything is your mom's vagina, no matter what, basically. And yeah. That's very fun. Uh, and then Jung is like, no, these are actual spirits of the other world. And you're like, all right, man, that's a little much too, because I'm in the dream eating French fries, which is crazy. Yeah. But uh, I, I take all of it. I think it's great. I think that I think whatever it is, it's incredibly weird that we fall asleep and our brains play movies in our heads. Uh, that Absolutely. doesn't make any sense. And you wake up and there's like very often a mythic structure to it. Like you have yes. these sort of parts. Why is that? Why do we wake up with a full story in our head? And some of them you wake up, you're panicked. Um, and I think you just kind of take them, you work through them. I think the Jungian idea of amplification is really good. I think yeah. uh, finding the mythic connections are, if nothing else, it, it, it breaks apart your rationality so that the imagination can play some kind of a role. And I, that's, I think, the safest way to describe it. Because otherwise you get into either woo-woo-y or, oh, they mean absolutely nothing. And I think it's your brain uh, speaking in a symbolic, non-rational, non-literal way, because the ego finally shuts up for uh, a part of the day. And, Dude, you just uh, gave me a spiritual good. boner. Thank you for that. I absolutely, I, I, I needed that today. It's a sexual. That's why I was hoping <laughs> we would get horny. Uh, okay, okay. You know, so okay. Just in light of what you said, have you ever read? Uh, he actually writes fiction. Came out with two novels late last year. Um, Cormac McCarthy. Mm -mm. He wrote the road. Um, so he has, oh, nice. I think, yeah, he, he has, he has one, if I'm not mistaken, one like nonfiction essay and it's on dreams and I'll have to send it to you. And, and his, his, his basic, I, I wouldn't say he's Jungian, but I think he definitely comes from a depth psychology approach. His, his argument is if you just think about our evolutionary history, we were painting shit on caves, likely dreaming 
far before we were actually speaking and kind of accessing that highly developed left part of our brain. So in yep. some ways, maybe the psyche is more comfortable with that side of our humanity than the other piece. Not to say the left hemisphere is not important, mm -hmm. but I, I found that kind of compelling that, that we have been totally. doing this shit for a long time. So long and it's unfathomable. I mean, McGilchrist writes in um, The Master and His Emissary, which is about the master over, or the emissary being taken, taking over the master, sure. emissary being the left hemisphere and master being the right hemisphere. But he talks about how skulls, um, it's, it's hypothesized that if you go back into like ancient people's like skulls, they had a, the size of the hole for the throat was the size that would require speech, but it, they predate speech by like mm. eons basically and the idea is that way before we were speaking like spoken language we were speaking in poetry and we were speaking yes. in music and uh there even like the history of sh like showing the written word uh you see that the words weren't broken apart yet it was all way more fluid and like holistic and you see it in the animal kingdom with um the way songs are used for mating purposes and so we were being metaphorical and poetic and musical potentially way before we were smarty pants people being yeah. like, well, this is what art done. It's kind of a beautiful thought, I think. Oh, it's a beautiful thought, man. I love it. Okay. Elliot, is there anything else that you feel like I've missed asking you or that's important about your own project? I'm, I'm I'll include all your links in the show notes, but you know, if people are interested in connecting with you, like, is there a website or, or something they should, they should look up in terms Dude, of what I'm, you do? I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I would say Instagram, uh, is okay, Instagram, always okay. fun. Yeah. Just Elliot Morgan. And I, uh, right now I'm, I'm marinating in this stuff. And so there's okay. not a lot of like, if you go to my social media stuff, I'm basically absent on it, but no, man, I mean, this has been really great. I feel like we just got started. So I do want to keep talking to you about this, but, um, if you will have me on again, oh, I will of course. continue Absolutely. and then, then we'll do the seance, uh, but only okay. if it makes sense. You know, and at some point we may have to like gang up on Pete Rollins, even though I love the whole Acanian and Hegelian, I, I connected with him on that. Maybe we should like smash him a little bit with yeah. like the whole depth psychology and Jung, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. He's <laughs> unfortunately, he's so, that guy is so smart uh, that there's no, I mean, he it's this so, is probably I, it's, true. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, even when I talk, I'm like, God, you still got it, huh? You're still just a smart piece of shit. All right, cool, cool. Uh, but yeah, thank you for having me, man. This of course, man. Very wonderful. Okay. All right. Well, will you end by just saying the line of the podcast, which is continue the conversation? Ooh, uh, continue the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, man.